Hello class, welcome. Hope you're all doing well. Today is Friday, I think. Days don't mean very much now. I just get these done ahead of time. Um, I don't do them all. I could do them all, I just finish in a day, but I think I would see more ragged as the lectures went on, right? So I'll space them out so <clears throat> you get my full enthusiasm and energy. And we're doing digestion. Uh, we have two weeks dedicated to this. There's only one week after that. So two weeks, uh, I have five lectures. Uh, we'll go through everything, teeth, anatomy, stomach, intestines, uh, then the physiology, how we break down all the things, everything that you eat. Yeah, it just comes into the this basic parts and how that gets into your body. Uh, and then hormones that involve hunger and so good, good stuff. So let's just begin this, huh? This guy decided to take a picture of everything he ate for three months. This is before we took pictures of all our meals and put them on Facebook, but pretty amazing. What do you think? Guy like pie. Guy like the pie. I can, uh, it's legit there. I like that. Donuts, quite a few donuts. Uh, yeah, if you took a picture of everything you ate, all your meals for three months, what do you think they look like? Yeah. We'll talk about weight loss too. And it turns out whenever you pay attention to what you eat, no matter what kind of diet you go on, if they, if you have you write down what you eat, you um, you eat less calories because you're paying attention to it. And these quarantine days, difficult. People eat out of boredom. So we'll get to all that. But bottom line here is all these different things this person ate. And then think about how different your diet is than your friends or relatives or then different cultures, how they survive on really different foodstuffs and then schedules and mostly you know what they're eating is so different but all of it gets broken down no matter what you eat you can spend so much money for that expensive meal uh, versus just a cheeseburger all of it's going to turn into this milkshake like uh, fluid in your stomach and uh, all going to be broken down to simple sugars amino acids fatty acids uh, nucleic nucleotides and all that basic constituents will get absorbed into your bloodstream, then you can use it as food. Yep. Everything goes down the hatch. Hopefully you, you chew it up. Um, and then uh, um, when it's in your body, it's not really in your body when it's in your gut tube either, right? It's on its way, tubes open on either ends, but uh, you'll break it down as smallest pieces and absorb uh, what you guys want in your along the way in your digestive tract. And your lifetime, 50 million calories. So, you know, what's that holy donut? So it's not going to hurt. Uh, I kid. Uh, yeah, all these calories. We'll see what they're going for, of course. Uh, yeah. What are you using them for? All these nutrients that you bring in? Well, one is the calories I talked about. It's just you guys use this for energy. Mostly carbs, but proteins and fats too. Oh, God. Uh, we break that down and we use uh, all those bonds, carbon bonds, uh, hydrogen bonds. We use that for um, to power all of our reactions, you know, whether it's a workout or whether it's just laying around. Your, your heart's beating, your mind is working, and you're using that ATP for um, sodium potassium pumps or your muscle contractions. So yeah, there's that, the energy. And secondly, it's just the constituents that you use to make up your body, to repair yourself, to build grow a baby if you want to do that. All these things, uh, um, the raw materials come from your diet. And of course, the water and vitamins and minerals, things like that, they're all coming in. And yeah, the basic constituents here, you know, you eat a cheeseburger, you don't absorb cheeseburger, you absorb all the carbs in that bun turn into simple sugars and they're absorbed and the meat into amino acids. So all these things, uh, have to be broken down into these tiny parts. Like if you want to build muscle, you don't have to eat muscle. You can eat any amino acids and um, your body can build it from those building blocks as long as it has everything. You have a complete diet. Uh, and then the waste is, uh, the undigestible parts will go out as waste. Yeah. Alimentary canal, alimentary tract is a tube from mouth to anus. And when you start out, it is in fact, a really simple tube. 
And what we do in our development is that parts expand to become the stomach. Uh, this part just grows and gets all tortuous. Uh, the mucosa, the inner lining, some of it's stratified squamous and some of it is columnar and uh, some has a lot of goblet cells, some doesn't. So this basic tube uh, that forms when you guys are a little ball of cells, it's going to have that indentation, right? And you're going to have a tube that goes through it. It's lined with endoderm. And there's endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm on the outside. Ectoderm becomes skin and uh, a nervous system. Mesoderm becomes muscles and bones. And then that, that endodermal tube will become your gut and everything that branches off of it, your liver, pancreas, and even your lungs will come from that endoderm layer too. Yeah. So it starts out a simple tube, and it remains a simple tube in a fish. It's still a simple fish, and then it just gets uh, crazy in the human. It's so different from your esophagus to your stomach and your intestines, but uh, all from the same tube. And just so I can clarify, yeah, <clears throat> you take something in your, your mouth and you swallow it, it's still not inside your body. This digestive tube varies widely from the acidity of your stomach uh, to the vacuous esophagus and empty unless there's something being swallowed um, but it's emptying the other end too um, your internal environment that you keep just perfect with all the electrolytes and the temperature and the water balance we talked about all that is, is different in your gut because that's just a tube temporary tube for food as it goes through and we'll see how it varies along the way <clears throat> we'll be following we'll do the mouth today in this lecture and then uh We'll fall all the way down and see the adaptations uh, in different parts of your gut tube for their functions. So we take food in. Food, you can have a liquid diet too. And, uh, but you chew it up in your tongue and saliva and your teeth. Uh, we'll make sure that it's uh, chewed up enough so it increases the surface area uh, of the food. And then uh, from that point on, the saliva will make it wet and it turns to this ball, this wet, moist ball called the bolus. So the bolus is what you form the food into. Saliva will wet it up if it's crackers or something. And then your tongue will push it to the back of your throat. And that begins a swallowing reflex we'll talk about. And in some places through your pharynx, it's going really quickly. Your esophagus is making its way down quickly. And it hits your stomach. And there it'll take hours churning around, right? And uh, through your intestines, it'll take hours to you defecate on the other ends. It'd be the waste material plus bacteria. We'll talk about that. That uh, your undigestible parts will be um, defecated out the other end. Indeed, do not let this picture disturb you. Just an example of eating. And the last slide also mentioned digestion that. Um, there's physical, so mechanical, physical is what you chew it up. Your stomach is gonna kind of grind it up. Your intestines will, will, will help uh, break it apart into its small pieces. And the smaller the chunks you can make your food, the more surface area, the more enzymes can, can work on it. And then chemical digestion, that is where we're gonna use acids and enzymes to break down the molecules from big starches in that bagel to little tiny monosaccharides uh, that you know, glucose and that you can absorb um, into your bloodstream. All right, we'll talk about this gut tube and the layers, very important. <coughs> and um, the mucosa is that inner lining. And you can see some of the uh, functions there. Along the way, a lot of mucus is gonna be coming out keeps things moving along. <clears throat> Everything has to be very wet. And you have a, a, you can dump tons of water in your gut tube and in your saliva, because you have a chance to reclaim it, right? Before it goes out the other ends, your large intestine will suck that water back into your, into your bloodstream. So tons of mucus and fluid is put into that meal to keep it moving along, keep it like this milkshakey consistency. It's gotta be a good barrier. You can, uh, you can eat all kinds of gross stuff. Uh, bacteria in it and uh, um, you want your gut to keep the bacteria away from getting in your bloodstream into your body so you see a lot of uh, um, uh, immune tissue along the way this diffuse immuno immunological cells definitely yeah 
So digestion, we talk about it. Key is that it's mechanical and chemical, right? And a snake swallows everything whole. It doesn't chew anything, really. Actually, mammals really chew things. I mean, you'll see a fish or a lizard you know, kind of clamp down to kill that bug or whatever it's eaten, right? But it just wants to swallow it and get it in there. And then the digestion can take much longer if you swallow big hunks of food. If you chew it, you're moving into small pieces, which are more surface area, you can more rapidly digest it. Even birds, you think they, they don't have teeth, they just you know, take food in, uh, but they have a, their esophagus is uh, modified, uh, well, like turkeys into a gizzard or chickens to uh, actually kind of grind the food up there with stones and mussels. So they also, birds have, remember, uh, high body temperature, they are very expensive like us, they eat lots of calories. So, but we use our teeth that are nicely put together, they come, they clued each other so we can really grind up our food into small little pieces. There's some terms here, ingestion, taking it in, you're going to propel it <clears throat> down the gut tube, it's going to make it all the way down. Absorption, that's when it gets into your, into your bloodstream, in your body officially, that's how you're going to absorb the things that you want. And then defecation is elimination of the food waste. Yeah, so we'll talk about elementary canal being that whole thing from mouth to anus. Uh, and then the accessory organs, oh, I'll show you in a picture here. There we go, yeah, look at that. So looking at this uh, <clears throat> elementary canal, you guys, are, you're aware of all these terms here, but your mouth, of course, oral cavity, you're gonna begin that digestion. And very critical, I'm sure it'll be a question, you know, that actually chemical digestion begins in the mouth. Uh, you just start digesting starches. And your pharynx, <clears throat> your throat, you know, food just is rapidly swallowed past that. You gotta make sure you don't get food down the wrong pipe, right? You gotta be careful there, the epiglottis. And then the esophagus is just a hallway, just a tube. No digestion takes place, it simply <clears throat> moves it from the mouth down to the stomach. It has to go through a hole in the diaphragm. We'll talk about that can be an issue. Into your stomach, which is a big, distensible sac that can hold a bunch of food. Um, go to the buffet, fill it up, and then just take hours to digest. Uh, it's very muscular, highly acidic, so it'll kill all the bugs, all of them, but it'll kill a lot of them, and get that food beginning to be digested. Your small intestines, the key is absorption. That's where you're going to, is the most surface area you're going to absorb your nutrients right there. Your large intestine is also called your colon, same thing. Uh, that's going to be for reclaiming water, some vitamins, and a lot of bacteria live in that. It's just preparing the waste. Small intestine does the work of absorbing your nutrients. These accessory organs, they, <clears throat> they form by budding off that tube. And salivary glands, so we'll talk about. It makes your spit help you. A little bit of uh, digestion. There's an enzyme we'll talk about, amylase, that breaks down starches. But otherwise, it's just going to wet it down, make it into a ball of food so you can swallow it. Your liver, largest organ inside your body, inside your skin. And a huge thing that does all kinds of things. It makes proteins, it makes the bile. And that bile <clears throat> is going to collect in your gallbladder. And your gallbladder is going to fill up with this greenish yellowish liquid uh, it's going to fill up your gallbladder when you eat meals especially fatty meals it'll squirt that bile into that food that's coming out of your stomach and then pancreas which we have talked about which you've seen in the lab in the microscope um, we've been talking about it before with the hormones insulin and glucagon now we're going to talk about what most of the pancreas does its exocrine function which is to make pancreatic juice which is filled with enzymes. It's gonna see it has bicarbonate to neutralize that stomach acid, and it's gonna squirt out with the gallbladder into your intestines right after the stomach. So those accessory organs, they have tubes that connect to the alimentary canal, which is the canal proper. Well, let's begin this lecture. We only get down through teeth, um, and we'll talk about taste and such, and we'll begin here in the oral cavity. Lips. Angelina, I just picked her randomly uh, to, uh, to show them. Not really. Um, uh, mammals have great lips. They're fleshy, 
incredibly sensitive, all kinds of uh, nerve endings there in your lips. And it's your first, besides kissing, you know, it's your first kind of uh, um, contact with foods. You can tell temperature, uh, and texture, um, very important also in mammals for suckling, for babies to suckle for the mom. They can make the seal around the nipple so that they can do that. Imagine like a, a lizard with those, doesn't have any lips, uh, or a bird, you know, it's not gonna work, but we have these fleshy lips, us mammals, so we can suckle as, as young, and then we have these sensitive lips to, uh, to test our environment for things we put in our mouth. Of course, I'm gonna show you histology, you know me. Um, Believe it or not, this redness to your lips is not, there's no red pigment. It's just blood. We're just seeing the blood because there's all kinds of blood vessels right there and we'll be able to see them. That's what looks red. And that's why your lips turn blue if you're very cold or carbon monoxide poisoning um, because we're seeing a lot of deoxygenated blood just under the surface. And the upper part of your lips out here, see lots of, you haven't shaved, or there's no razors in the nowadays. I have plenty of razors, I'm just lazy. Um, but the lips out here is just skin with hair, right? Stratified squamous, keratinized. And then when we get to this, call this vermilion border, this is a little red border where your lips start, that's the beginning of this gut tube. And you get stratified squamous, but non-keratinized. And the inside of your lip, see it's all wet in there. It's gonna say moist, wet, whatever. Um, again, in your cheeks, in your inside of your lip, it's stratified squamous, non-keratinized with just lots of you see lots of glands in here making lots of saliva, mucus. Yeah. You guys see the muscle? See the muscle in this region? It's going to be that orbicularis oris to help purse up your lips. And looking up here, you see stratified squamous, and there's going to be hair follicles in there. Hair. Cool. Here's that kissing uh, muscle, uh, the orbicularis oris. It's going to circle the lips like that. There are other facial muscles, uh, remember zygomaticus, and there's, we didn't learn depressor anguli oris, other things that are going to cause you to smile, to frown, to move uh, your lips. But orbicularis oris is that sphincter, which will give you that, uh, that uh, kissing kind of thing. Oh, look at baby, so cute. Um, I don't have any babies, but um, there's actually, our minds are just programmed to find this adorable. Any kind of, actually, little kittens, little puppies, whatever. It's this large head with a disproportionately large eyes and small nose that uh, we have been uh, programmed to love and not kill, you know, uh, to, to take care of. Um, and people will... I don't know if I told you that, but people say, oh my goodness, baby just loves me. It sees my face and it just lights up. Turns out you can just take a pie plate and just with a Sharpie kind of make a face, put it next to the baby, it will smile and light up. Oh. I mean, they grow up and they learn to know people, but early on there's a reflex where they smile. We think it's so that, again, we protect them. So this crying, crapping thing, you know, it's gonna be a lot of work that we say, oh, okay, you know, I guess I'll take care of it, you know, so our species can go on. I digress. Um, looks like I was talking about cheeks here. Uh, you see baby cheeks are particularly pinchable and they have a, a buccal fat pad and this fat pad that disappears as you get older. So uh, I believe it keeps the cheeks a little more rigid because they're suckling, they're making suction to get the milk out of mom and so, they have a little more sturdy cheeks that they're using often. That's pretty, pretty damn cute. And buccinator. We did this muscle too. We studied that last semester. That's your cheeks. And uh, with your tongue and your cheeks, you uh, keep the food, you keep moving it over the molars, the right and left side. You keep it over the molars so the food can be uh, ground. We're talking about grain or something like that. So. Your tongue and buccinator will keep moving the food over your flat molar so you can uh, uh, keep chewing it until you feel like you've broken it down enough and wetted it with saliva. And then your tongue pushes it to the back of your throat. So buccinator, this muscle right here. And your lips make a seal, you close them so you can chew so food doesn't fall out. Um, definitely. All right, function of cheeks and lips right out of your book. All right, let's get in there. Start doing some anatomy here. Uh, you see your teeth. Wow, this guy's got great teeth right here. Um, 
And uh, the oral cavity is going to be that space um, coming from your teeth in front, uh, back to your where your uvula hangs down. Behind that will be your oropharynx back there. But your oral cavity, uh, the, the floor will be your tongue. It's a massive uh, muscle down there. And the roof will be your palate, hard and then soft palate right there. All right, so that makes up this where the oral cavity is going to be. Now we, we give a name to this uh, this area here between your your uh, here between your cheek and your teeth. Where you put your chew right there. It's going to be your your uh, vestibule, your oral vestibule. And so it's that space between your your teeth and your and your lips, and your cheeks on the side. And you'll also see if you look in the mirror, you'll see a little uh, connection. Well, you can see that or not. Um, right here, right here. Yeah, it's the frenulum or labial frenulum here. Um, it's a little connection. Um, some people will get this uh, surgically worked on. If uh, it's too big, you'll have a gap. Either one, you have a gap in your teeth if that frenulum is too big. You have a lingual frenulum too under your tongue. I had your tongue right under there. And some people get that cut too if they're not speaking right, if they can't stick their tongue out. So frenulum, a little, uh, little piece of tissue that comes right there. All right. Well, I said all kinds of opportunity for uh, bad guys to get into your body through uh, your oral cavity. And so we have a ring of lymphatic tissue called the tonsils, which I've talked about already with uh, immunology. So this ring, you guys know the back of your, maybe you don't know this, back of your tongue, we call it the lingual tonsil. You can't see it, it's like really rough on the very back, of the root of your tongue, you don't really see. Your normal tonsils, your palatine tonsils at the back of your throat, that cause a lot of problems. And then your adenoids uh, will be, or your um, uh, pharyngeal tonsils also called, will be back and just up above your soft palate, so you don't see those also. But if your palatine or your adenoids um, are chronically um, swollen, you can get them removed. You know, antibiotics don't do anything. They, they used to remove tonsils left and right, but now we, we try to see if we can keep them because they provide some protection there. Ah, oh, here's some swollen tonsils. I've seen people like these. Maybe some of you out there had tonsil problems like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. The roof of your mouth. Look at the roof of your mouth there. You feel it? Kind of ridgy there. Hard. Or, oh, back there makes you want to gag a little bit. Is is you feel it softer. So the bone. You guys should know this. Your maxillary bone and your palatine bone, and then it becomes cartilage, and you have that little uvula, that little punching bag that hangs off the back too. So the hard palate on your the teeth. Pretty far back when your soft palate is behind it. And your soft palate, along with that uvula, when you swallow, that will, hello? When you swallow, that will, yeah, gosh, um, it will come up and it will block that nasal cavity. So, you know, milk doesn't come out of your nose. All right. All right, another view looking at it here. You will see that roof of your mouth, ridgy, and um, yeah, that skin is really tightly attached onto your, uh, onto that bone. Very, very cool. Your gums too, we're talking about your gums. Also stratified squamous, but they come up uh, right to the teeth. Here's this uvula, and um, Little thing that hangs in the back of your throat. I found some pictures, one of them pierced right here. And then uh, one you can see split like that, that's crazy. <clears throat> and uh, this little thing, it can't be too long. I can actually kind of tickle back here and they can they can take care of that. But this is a good view. You're seeing your, your soft palate here with the uvula coming down. And you can imagine if you're swallowing food that this whole region will, will come up to close it off. <clears throat> your nasal cavity, right? You know, if you want to sneeze, that will stay down and your tongue will block it off and it will force the air to come out your nasal cavity. And a cough, you'll close it off and the air will come out your mouth, right? 
All right, the tongue. The tongue is a sack of skeletal muscle. You control it, skeletal muscle. Uh, our slide for skeletal muscle is usually tongue because you can get it going every which direction there. And uh, we'll talk about the tongue. So indeed, you can see uh, um, that it is, uh, uh, you look at the, the direction of the muscles coming every which way because you have so much um, uh, movement of your tongue, some people more than others. And it's going to be attached, you can see it here to your mandible, down from your hyoid bone, tons and tons of muscle right there. And it's going to allow you for speech, for, for eating. Uh, yeah, let's take a look at it. You can buy it at uh, Hannaford, well, not always, but you can see that um, lengua, it's delicious in tacos, things like that. It's just a skeletal muscle like any other that we eat. So this is a nice view of a tongue, looking at the histology of it. You can see that uh, the papilla are gonna be these, these little uh, projections that we'll talk about that come off of it. And then muscle, 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 skeletal muscle, going every which way. Will be fat in there too and then glands glands are going to make uh, um, saliva mucus now under your tongue um, if you look under your tongue it's uh, it looks different than the top of your tongue under your tongue has its kind of a uh, like a saran wrappy kind of a f uh, clear membrane on it and you can see a couple veins running under your tongue um, so the stratified squamous is under your tongue, but non-keratinized. Now I should mention, piercing your tongue should be left to the professionals, on like your ear, because there's some big arteries and veins in there that you would want to hit. I could hit much going through your, your lobe. All right, I digress. Um, looking at the tongue, like when I threw it out there on the, on the table, like looking at that cow tongue, you can see how big it is. It's really big in the human too. It's just, uh, I stick out, you just see a little bit of the front, but it's a huge muscle in there. And that anterior two thirds um, is the part that you see. And then that root, the back third, um, it's bumpy because there's a ton tonsillar tissue back there and you don't see. And it's up, someone showed me a picture, but I won't say who. You can look in there, you can see your epiglottis too. Um, if you put a camera back there normally you can see you can see that so don't forget that it's what's going to cover over your your larynx when you swallow and look at your tongue it's bumpy definitely on top there yeah and uh these little bumps uh little papillae papillae is a little nubbin remember the renal papilla is a little top of the pyramid there so a little nubbin that comes out and we'll talk about the various ones but you can see there's this kind of a v-shaped pattern of like these circumvallate ones that are really big way back there and the little fungiform look like little mushrooms little fungi and then filiform you will see that those are just going to be for texture really and then foliates humans don't have a lot of those but kind of like pages on the side so we can look at these filiform ones are um, pointy with keratin no taste buds involved here and you can really see if you look at your cat yeah, look at that. And uh, those things are just keratin. The purpose is not for tasting. The purpose well, for the cat is what? Well, they can rasp the meat off of bones with that rough tongue. And for grooming, you know, they'll lick their fur and it helps with that. We have some of those too. Fungiform, like little fungi, little mushrooms. And these are scattered throughout your tongue. And uh, they have taste buds on them. And here you can see they put some dye if they want to see. They can become inflamed too. Um, but they're scattered throughout, mostly the front of your tongue for taste. Here's folate. You can see, uh, or folate, folate, folate. You know, one. They look like little pages. And if you go to the library, the section of the big books is the folios. So kind of made these long kind of pages on our sides. And here's the biggie, the circumvallate. They make like a V shape. Behind them would be the, the root of your tongue. And you can see these taste buds here. Look at them all, like little uh, clearish onions, kind of like right within the epithelium of that. And, and not to forget again, I keep saying, these serous glands are making these liquid that'll come out to keep your tongue moist all the time. Yeah, that shows some, some big circumvallate back there. 
So taste buds, they're scattered. You have some roof of your mouth size, but it's mostly they're on your tongue. And uh, what you're looking at here is a little pore, a little sensory hairs, and these are all the, the cells, modified neurons and their helper cells, to convert chemicals that are gonna bind onto these little receptors to go down a nerve that will take it back into your brain to light up your brain when uh, certain receptors are hit, salty, sweet, so these uh, um, cells in your taste buds, you uh, you make new ones because you can about every week or so I think you make some new uh, taste bud cells, but they work with these receptors to tell your brain you know what's in your mouth. And all the foods that you taste need to be wet. They need to the substances need to dissolve in water. So that's why you have all the saliva and the wetness in your mouth. Yeah, so here's a nice picture of it. You can see that nice little pore. And on here will be the receptors for various substances, salts, sugar, you'll see amino acids. So I, uh, I'm going to review a little bit because I did this last semester for, so most of you heard that, talking about the senses, talked about the sense of taste. But you all, of course, are familiar with sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. And then the newest one is umami, which is a savory taste you'll find in cheeses and tomatoes and things like that, uh, soy sauce. Um, and what do they actually sense? Uh, sweet is going to sense uh, sugars. And um, you can put crackers in your mouth, and if you chew them and leave them in your mouth, you'll start, you'll start to taste that sweetness as the enzymes break down the polysaccharides into simple sugars. Sourness is telling you um, um, hydrogen ions, and specifically, sour is going to tell you. Saltiness would be sodium channels, and remember, we need sodium, so you, you'll be able to tell if you're getting these electrolytes. A uh, bitter, often the back of your tongue, uh, but throughout, um, would be alkaloids, They're often a, a sign of um, toxins, or poisons. And umami is an amino acid, and so it's telling you, hey, I'm getting uh, amino acids in my diet. Now this, this tongue map is just an example of how uh, we use this in textbooks for decades and decades that we thought this was the distribution. And it was a mistake. It, it wasn't actually something that we, we, we found out. It was just kind of carried on, which can happen. So the science have to question everything and uh, uh, don't take things uh, for granted without evidence. So this is the, there's some, concentrations of them here, sweet towards the front, but there's not like a map in parts of your tongue. All parts of your tongue can, can sense all these tastes. So indeed, this umami is fascinating. Um, so it's an MSG, which we'll put into uh, foods, like Asian foods. Uh, um, specifically, it's exactly a glutamate. Um, it's going to really make those uh, sensors pop. But in, uh, in other uh, foods, it gives, it's called, a, it's a savory taste. And evolutionarily, it's telling you, oh, I'm getting amino acids, which means that's useful. And these, these senses, these few senses, and um, taste is just a blunt instrument compared to smell. It's much more detailed. But uh, your foods are not purely, you know, salty, sweet, bitter. We don't eat salt and then pure glucose. They're going to be a mixture of these things. And um, yeah, so margarita will be the, the sourness of a... Of a limes along with the saltiness of salt that you put in there definitely and you'll see bitter chocolate sits on the the sweet bitter spectrum and again i uh, won't go through the senses like we did during senses but uh, if you look here at at, uh, at this half of uh, taste versus smell you can see which is more sensitive which has more subtlety to it it's your sense of smell look at that all the breaking it down. Taste is a blunt instrument. Uh, when you enjoy a good meal or a wine or a beer, um, you're getting your, your taste buds of being fired in your tongue. But also you're, you're, as you breathe in and as you bring the food to your mouth, you're breathing. And um, the, the, what really makes a good meal good is going to be your sense of smell. These subtle, volatile chemicals that will come up. <clears throat> and then your, your sense of smell is, uh, is uh, beautifully fine-tuned. And I say it's beautifully fine-tuned, um, but remember, uh, talked about how um, 
It's important when you're young to expose children to lots of different foods and smells. Um, and even though they're stubborn, they only want to have fish sticks and pizza or something like that. Um, the minds are plastic when you're young, and that's when you build that software to be able to enjoy uh, the rich tapestry of the smells and tastes of the world. So if you uh, keep an infant just with a simple diet, it will grow up to not be able to tell uh, and enjoy life. That's definitely that's what I would definitely what I would say. Uh, there are, in fact, <clears throat> about half of us are in the middle, but there are super tasters. That There are people that just cannot stand uh, 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 Brussels sprouts or broccoli or cabbage. It tastes very powerful to them. And they just have more of these taste buds, and there are certain tests you can do to see if you're a super taster. On the other end, a non-taster. Uh, and cilantro is another one. My brother hates cilantro just with a passion. So a lot of you out there have genetics that tell you that it tastes soapy and not very good. And me, I love cilantro. Hey, all right, finally, we'll get to uh, the next lecture will be teeth. Uh, so some of you are interested in that, that are in the tooth world. And uh, this is my, my teeth. I, I now have a tooth here. So, well, it's an implant, but uh, yeah. All right, so hope you enjoy the first digestion lecture. And uh, the next one, we'll start with teeth and we'll keep working our way down.